Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Wendy Catherine. I am the Executive Director of Health Nexus Santé, a health promotion organization here in Canada. I'm so proud today to be co-hosting this session where we will be sharing an interview by the eminent Professor Ilona Kickbush. The interview is by Veronica Shiroya and Mihaili Kokaini, and they will be introducing themselves. Suffice to say, two quick announcements. One, please take the time to go to the forum section of the app for the conference and to remember to write down any impressions, comments, keywords, messages that you have for us. We will be taking those uh, words and adding them into a consensus statement after the conference that will summarize the principles, the innovative conversations, and key influential statements that will influence world health after the conference is over. So please visit there often and make sure that your impressions of each plenary session are registered. It is with my great pleasure that I now move to the video presentation and we will have some minutes afterwards to share with our audience an opportunity for a live interactive discussion with Professor Kickbush afterwards. Suffice to say, uh, she is a dignitary, not only a professor, but a health advocate and a health diplomat. And we are very, very excited to hear your words and to be in dialogue with you afterwards. Video, please. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the participants of the Canadian Conference on Global Health and the 10th Forum, 10th Global Forum on Health Promotion. So this meeting is aimed at uh, global health professionals and also host civil health promotion activists. So today's interview takes place at the invitation of the Alliance for Health Promotion, an NGO based in Geneva. And our guest is Professor Ilona Kipush. We aim to explore with her how far we have come from the Ottawa Charter and what are the current challenges of health promotion. So we'll start by introducing ourselves. I am Veronica Shiroya from Kenya originally, and I'm an international uh, public health practitioner and researcher and currently a doctorate candidate at the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health, uh, University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Mihai Kirkin. I am helping Veronica to make this interview. So I'm a co-reporter. I'm Hungarian, a medical doctor, a former politician. At the moment, I work as a lecturer at various universities, and I'm also a consultant at the World Health Organization. So uh, the global health community knows Professor Kikush quite well, but let me just greet her as the key creator of uh, the health promotion concept, who's had a distinguished career at the WHO at the Yale University. And she's also the founder and chair of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Her interest includes the political determinant of health, health in all policies, health diplomacy and global health. Uh, but let me go ahead with the first uh, question. Ilona, four years ago in Shanghai, in your closing remarks at the ninth global conference uh, on health promotion, you made it clear that health promotion has become a political and global issue. And in fact, uh, health promotion appears in high-level documents such as the UN Declaration on Universal Health Coverage last year and some others. Uh, could you make this approach tangible for us? Well, thank you, Mihaly, and uh, thank you, Veronica, and I'm delighted uh, to be part of this conversation. 
Uh, hello to everybody who is watching. To come to your question, uh, Michali, I think there's a, a difference uh, if one looks at uh, the progress achieved uh, in health promotion as a discipline, uh, health promotion as an approach, you know, the five areas of the Ottawa Charter, and we'll come back to those, and health promotion as a mind frame. Remember, the subtitle of the Ottawa Charter was towards a new public health. And the key message really was one of empowerment, empowering people, empowering communities. And I think rarely in global health and public health has that message of empowerment been as strong as it presently is. Just also think of the feminist contributions to health promotion and global health, the decolonization movement in global health. So this message of empowerment on the one hand, the other key message was that health is a resource, uh, a resource for everyday life. And uh, initially, maybe that resource source discussion was a bit too economic. You know, we took this notion of investment in health, uh, took that forward very much. But I think now, and again, I come to health promotion as a mind frame, if we look at the SDGs, if we look at SDG 3, which doesn't only speak of health, but speaks of well-being, that notion of health as a resource for where people live, love, work and play. So how do they have a good life has really come to the fore. And I think health promotion as a discipline and as an approach has pushed that kind of thinking over the last 30, 35 years very strongly. So um, thank you. And um, so let us move to the pandemic, which also touches on what you've just mentioned. And um, I want to cast the light on the global south, which often looks to the global north for direction when it comes to handling um, global health uh, emergencies. So, however, what we are seeing is that continents such as Africa so far have surpassed some expectations in COVID-19 outcomes, considering the difficulties they face every day in their realities. So, in your opinion, what lessons could the world learn from Africa, for example, or the global south in general in these times, as far as health promotion is concerned? Veronica, that's an incredibly important question, and I would actually challenge one of the sentences that you've used to say the Global South uh, looks to the Global North. Uh, I think it does less of that, and, uh, and I think that's important, and we're learning that, as you rightly said now during COVID-19. What's a key lesson from the Global South, from Ebola, from SARS, polio, tuberculosis, etc.? we've learned about the importance of communities, of involving communities. And to some extent in the Global North, we have lost that understanding of how important communities are in actually addressing uh, health issues. Of course, in the Global North, we also lost uh, the relationship, the cultural understanding of an infectious disease. And uh, we have found that the experience of dealing with Ebola, the infrastructure that we have in uh, many countries of the global south from polio eradication efforts, many of these things have contributed. And of course, one other factor is that Africa has a very, very young population. So also the distribution, of course, of uh, the uh, COVID-19 is quite different. At the same time, of course, and that is the key health inequalities message also in uh, health promotion, we are finding that uh, the fall into poverty of children, of young people, of women, of the population overall is uh, absolutely very, very worrying. And, uh, and here the Global North does come in, and that is how do we ensure common goods? How do we share resources? And to what extent is the Global North willing, for example, through debt relief, uh, through cancellation of debt, I would say, to help the countries of the Global South get through this crisis? 
Ilona, um, the Global Health Community uh, recognizes your role in developing uh, the Global Health Diplomacy concept. And in addition to the pandemic, global challenges affecting health uh, includes the migration, tackling the determinants of non-communicable diseases, urbanization, or cope with climate change, really upgraded the role of global health diplomacy. So how do you feel? Uh, what is the role of health promotion in this process? Well, Michali, from the start, health promotion has been about the determinants of health. In the charter, it's still called the prerequisites. Uh, the language uh, has changed. And I think it's very interesting and important to go back to the charter and actually see that it was the first uh, WHO document to actually speak of ecological challenges and to uh, create that synergy between an ecological movement and a health movement. It was also, you will remember because you were there in Ottawa, we had invited the representatives of the women's movement, recognizing that social movements play an incredibly important role in taking health forward and uh, in uh, expressing health promotion goals. So I think, first of all, you know, that focus on the determinants has actually been strengthened also through the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. But we've seen that, and this refers also to your question, we've seen that two other determinants are absolutely cri critical. One is what we now call the commercial determinants of health. That is the fact that within a consumer society, which is becoming globalized, our everyday lives are more and more defined by commercial goals, also in the digital sphere. And I'm very, very happy to see that there's so much more work on the commercial determinants. And then, of course, what we call the political determinants. And we're seeing that now very clearly and again and again, we need to stress uh, this fact. Health is always about political choices and health is always also about power. And these power shifts have to be addressed by health promotion. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I, your point brings me to the question on um, digital uh, transformation when we speak of the impact of the commercial determinants in this space of the digital transformation. And also when we just look in general, how we see an increasing number of evolving partnerships to promote digital transformation. Um, we can say that the advancement of technology has been a positive contribution to surviving the current times. However, for uh, global health, there has been a potential downside which ha some have described as the infodemic. So what experience and lessons do you think we could take from health promotion, particularly in this era of, of uh, digital uh, transformation? Well, Veronica, first of all, I think that health promotion has to put a real priority on dealing with the digital transformation and its various aspects and probably it's starting to be one of the determinants of health as well. It's something we have to explore in greater depth. And I've obviously, I've written also about the dark side of this digital transformation, how it actually gets uh, in the way of empowerment because of the surveillance components and because of what you said, uh, the infodemic, uh, the uh, information that cannot be trusted, etc. I think in health promotion, we have to bring together three literacies, the health literacy. And again, that is a movement that has gained a lot of strength, uh, the digital literacy component of that. But what we forget, and that again is linked to empowerment, is what many people now call civic literacy. That is how we deal with each other, the democratic components of this. And I think health promotion is challenged to develop an approach 
that combines health literacy, digital literacy, and civic literacy. That will be one of the really important things and look at forms as we do in public health also of regulatory measures, health protection measures, and health promotive measures that we undertake in the course of the digital transformation. Ilona, uh, in these days, uh, we see an increasing number of evolving partnerships in the field of uh, global health. And in the same time, um, global health is uh, increasingly on the agenda of major global meetings. And um, uh, could I ask that, how do you feel? Is there a risk that governmental and international commitments cut the ground from under the feet of NGOs and the actions of civil society at local level? And in the context of health promotion, what is the importance of civil society these days? Thank you, Mihaly, and I already referred to it at the beginning. A lot of the thinking on health promotion was informed by social movements, was informed by the understanding of empowerment and taking action, being a social actor. And we see that now. We see young people taking social action and uh, uh, pushing the environmental agenda we have seen throughout the years a whole range of really, really critical health movements. And we see now, for example, the NCD movements and uh, the patient movements that uh, people say, you know, what is it like to live with a chronic disease? What is it like to live with tuberculosis? To give these diseases not just a medical face, but a human face and a social face. And that takes us back to the issue of power. You know that the fifth action area of the Ottawa Charter obviously was reorient health systems. And that has been one of the toughest things of all to actually involve patients, to include patients, to hear their voices, to give them power and to share power within the health system with patients and between the various health professionals. You know, we started uh, the health promoting hospitals. And that was a project that tried to democratize the health system. And so just as we uh, push forward to uh, involve uh, communities in a variety of ways, we should try and see how that health system itself will become a democratic undertaking. And then it will be healthier for everyone, those who have to enter it and those who have to work there. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, Professor Kikush, we um, we noticed that traditionally the focus on on health promotion services has often centered on the recipients, who are the general public, the communities and households. But uh, one thing that's um, come to light with regards to the health different health system challenges that both the global north and the global south faces is this impact it has had on health workers and health service providers who are severely impacted due to the interactive nature of their work. So in that regard, um, what could health promotion play or the civil society play in addressing these uh, disparities among health workers and providers, both in the clinical settings, as uh, mentioned before, and also in the non-clinical settings? Well, Veronica, this is what health promotion tried to do with the settings approach. Uh, we said, you know, there are contexts in which health is created, where people live, love, work and play. That was taken up by the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And we said, you know, if we take a setting like a school, like a hospital, like an older person's home, etc., we have to look at it as an interactive dynamic system. And these systems can only be health promotive if uh, the working conditions are good, if the interaction and the, commun and the communication 
between uh, in the pupils and the teachers, between involving the community and the parents, if we look at schools. And the same thing is true of, uh, of health systems, be they primary healthcare centers, be they hospitals, be they emergency centers. And we saw that in COVID-19, that uh, without an interface between the community and the health systems, without an understanding of when to go to the health systems and when to take care of yourself and an understanding of taking care of others. I think, you know, a key health promotion thinking is that it's not just individual. It's not just about me. It's about all of us. And the director general of WHO always speaks of solidarity. And in the early days of COVID, we experienced some of this solidarity of helping each other. And I think the health promotion thinking also tries to bring across, we have responsibility to some extent where we can influence it, not everyone can, for our own health. But more important is health solidarity, that we support each other, that we protect each other, and in terms of empowerment, that we fight for each other, that we have our right to health. Uh, thank you very much, Ilona. And uh, my last question uh, uh, brings us a little bit back uh, to the pandemic, but also uh, touches upon uh, the solidarity. Um, we see that during the pandemic, the health system performance is on the verge of being in many countries. Lockdown measures have led to economic downturns, all exacerbated by geopolitical tensions. International solidarity has been questioned by the confinement of several nation states, the spread of nationalism and populism. So what do you think, what kind of role health promotion may play in this situation? Well, Michali, that of course is a big challenge and particularly a challenge uh, for politicians and uh, their commitment to multilateralism, their commitment to the World Health Organization. And uh, those commitments are of a different nature. They can be, you know, clear political commitments to support multilateralism, but they also need financial commitment. You know, we need 35 billion for COVAX to ensure that everyone in the world uh, gets vaccinated. So there are many of these solidarity movements that are going on. And actually at present, we see two things at the same time some major players moving out of multilateralism, but uh, a whole range of other actors, both states and civil society, and even private companies saying, we need this multilateral system, we need to protect it, we need to take it forward. So part of that also is reform, and therefore the role of civil society, for example, in terms of the reforms of the World Health Organization, the reforms of the international health regulations is very, very important. And again, you know, we come back to the right to health and many of the economic issues that need to be addressed, for example, in the G20, uh, in ensuring, as I mentioned before, uh, debt cancellation, uh, for example. So, but an important thing is, that kind of action must not only happen at the international level, it must happen at the national level as well. It's important for civil society, but also for parliamentarians in particular, to give a message to governments. We want you to support the World Health Organization. We want you to support multilateralism. We want you to support global solidarity and each and every single voice is important for that. Uh, so many thanks uh, for your insights, uh, Professor Kikush, which uh, demonstrate that health promotion indeed has a great responsibility in these critical periods. Um, in the 21st century, the scope for health promotion is uh, different clearly and than when the concept was born back in 1986. 
Uh, but the spirit of Otawa is indeed alive, uh, advocating, mediating, enabling role of health promotion is more important than ever. And without civil society, without the ownership of the people and the communities, uh, no progress indeed can be made. Thank you, Ilona, really very much for being with us and having this interview. Uh, really, we have enjoyed uh, very much talking uh, with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihaly and Veronica. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Kickbush and to Veronica and Mihaly for this interview. We have approximately one half hour with Professor Kickbush to have an interactive dialogue, which will be exceptionally illuminating given the momentum that is already building at the conference between the discussions around One Health um, at the Good All Talk, and there have been numerous opportunities to dig deeper into indigenous ways of knowing and the understandings around the connections between civil society and other aspects of the health promotion and health systems. Um, I would love to give the audience an opportunity to go to the app to begin to register your questions. You can do that there in the question and answer section and we will be seeing your questions and lining them up for answer by one of our panelists. Um, I'd like to turn to Dr. Rudiker Krach, Director of Health Promotion at the World Health Organization for a comment in response to uh, Professor Kickbush's talk and then to kick off our questions to, to Dr. Kickbush with the first question. Over to you, Rudiker. Thank you very much, Wendy. And what a profound pleasure to uh, listen to this very insightful interview. Thank you very much for that. And, um, well, indeed, uh, uh, there are a couple of um, questions um, that come to mind. Um, uh, we've been um, saying for a long time that health is central to development and uh, that it needs to be uh, also taken much more into consideration when making decisions in other sectors. And now with the COVID crisis, we see exactly that because the um, the uh, epidemics and now this pandemic um, have all come to the fore because of decisions in other sectors. If you take H1N1 15 years ago, H5N1 10 years ago, Ebola five years ago, MERS, and now COVID, um, they all um, came to the fore because of decisions in other sectors regarding mobility, regarding um, the uh, decreasing space between human and animal um, uh, habitats. Um, and we have about 40 other risks that could actually um, uh, lead to a new epidemic or pandemic. And unless we take uh, health much more into consideration not only after those decisions have been taken, but when those decisions are taken so that uh, people take informed decisions in those other sectors about the potential health implications, um, I think we would, uh, we would not be well prepared. So um, I'm saying that because health promotion uh, has been at the forefront uh, of um, a movement which is called Health in All Policies as well. And Ilona, you talked about this uh, in, in your interview as well. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm wondering how we can help assist now um, the world to be better prepared next time um, and to, to, to uh, create a governance uh, in member states uh, that actually take health much more into consideration. I'm also thinking, and Ilona, again, you touched on that very nicely, about how health promotion instruments with um, the, you talked about the mind frame of, of health promotion and these this mind frame of 
community engagement, of participation, is actually supported by health promotion instruments. And I'm wondering how we can now, as uh, people working in the discipline um, of health promotion, um, can assist better in the response in this next, in this second phase of this pandemic. As we all know, people are getting tired. Um, compliance in the first phase was pretty high in most of um, the population, in most of the people. Um, and many people are now moving to a second phase of uh, being more complacent about this and being less rigid in following up the public health measures that are imposed. And there's reasons for that. Um, number one, people are getting tired, they're fatigued. Um, and that is in the first place quite normal as this pandemic is, is taking a long time. But then it has other reasons. And that is because very often people get these measures from the international and national levels without that they are translated into their realities of everyday life in their communities. So in health promotion, we have instruments for that. We know that campaigns and compliance also about in the, in the health services um, is lower if that, that these are done uh, without involving the people they are meant for. So we have developed a co-design. We have developed the participation of the people that are concerned into our measures. And I'm wondering whether in this phase, in this second phase of the pandemic, we shouldn't perhaps look much, much more into this co-design in translating the nationally um, uh, agreed measures into the local realities. And that does not mean to water them down. It does not mean not to comply with those measures, but it means to make them more meaningful, uh, more understandable and more real for the people. So these are two issues which I would like to bring back to Ilona and uh, Mihaly and Veronica. Um, and there's a third one, which perhaps we might touch on in the discussion, which is that we're not only looking at the um, addressing the risks of disease. In health promotion, we're turning our back, if you will, to disease and look at the health and well being. Um, and so the question for me also in the aftermath of this pandemic would be, would it be not helpful to look at well-being as a guide um, for development? We now see that economic development alone is not working. Economic development as such is first of all empty, but we can fill the um, measure of economic development with some values which are based on people's and society's well-being. So that also is very much in the mindset of health promotion. And I would like to turn back to the panel asking how we can use well-being as a fundamental shift for looking at development overall. Thank you very much, for Wendy, for this. Thank you, Rudiker. And to you, Professor Kickbush, I wonder if you have some comments to kick us off. And we've received already a few questions from the audience, which we can go to next. You've, uh, I can't open my video. I think the uh, organizers have to do something here. Perhaps we can, uh, we'll look for some help right away from yes, our technician. Thank you very and much. Would so you like I, I think, uh, okay, now I've got a message here. All right, hello. 
So uh, I think uh, Rüdiger has mentioned uh, a number of critical things. One of the most critical, I think, is around well-being. And uh, of course, uh, starting in 1948 with the WHO constitution, the constitution actually spoke about health and well-being. And, uh, but it was forgotten because well-being was thought of being something much too vague to deal with, and at least you can measure disease. We've advanced significantly, and if you look at the work of the OECD, for example, on well-being indicators, we have a whole range of measurements where we can compare countries according to their level of well-being. And we've had other movements like in New Zealand with the well-being budget, uh, to say, you know, the success of a society cannot only be measured by its gross national product, it's got to be measured by the quality of life and the life satisfaction of the citizens, of the people living uh, in that society. So I think a lot of work has been done on this, and uh, this notion uh, that initially, as I mentioned in the interview, where investment in health was more or less seen as an economic category, has moved very, very much in the discussions. And last not least, the European Union has taken up thinking around uh, well-being economies uh, that, you know, where do we need to invest? And this leads to the fact, you know, we need to think differently about how how our societies are structured, what runs them, what drives them. We need new economic models. And there are those models out there and they're being tested out. You will know that you know, from health promotion came the notion of healthy cities. Now there's a new economic model called the donut model of circular economies. And for example, the city of Amsterdam is trying to restructure itself to run according to this donut model. So there's a lot of innovation out there that is linked to health promotion thinking where health promoters could link up and uh, where political decisions are taken for health. And here, of course, also, and uh, for me, that was you know, an absolutely extraordinary experience when I first traveled to New Zealand and you know, we had developed this uh, uh, model of health promotion, which is the circle and the waves, et cetera, et cetera. And I was invited uh, to uh, join uh, a, a community meeting of uh, one of the Maori communities. And uh, they had a symbol for health, which more or less looked, you know, like this holistic Ottawa Charter. And uh, through our new thinking in the West, you know, planetary health and health promotion and one health, et cetera, to some extent, we're only just catching up with communities in the global South that have had a well being concept of health maybe for thousands of years. And so I think we need to make that learning a reality. And that's also one of the issues of decolonizing global health. Thank you very much. Our first question from the audience is from Anka Matai. She says, thank you for the interesting interview. I was wondering if Professor Kickbush could comment on whether she thinks conspiracy theorists and science deniers have had a substantial impact on health promotion efforts, both in terms of longstanding issues such as climate change and more acute issues such as COVID, what are some of the solutions that you see that have worked in the past and that will strengthen public health past barriers such as conspiracy, political uh, politicization and science denial? Well, first of all, I think we do have to recognize health is always political, always. You know, we see that when we compare societies who has uh, publicly financed uh, health systems, who has private health systems, there are you know, differences in ideology, whether you should tax sugar or you shouldn't. There's always politics in public health. You know, there's no way to avoid that. The issue is, you know, how do you address it? And uh, for me, I think one of the really critical things has been, and the pandemic has shown us again, 
all the things we haven't done before the pandemic. We have neglected health literacy. There is no question about that. In our societies, at least you know, in the global north, we thought, you know, forget infectious disease. We never talked to our population about that. We have underestimated science literacy and we have definitely underestimated civic literacy. And so, of course, if a crisis comes, if you haven't invested in the dialogue with, in quotes, your population and your communities before, all the negative sides are going to come up afterwards. And if on top of that, you have a, a, a digitalization, a social media infrastructure that absolutely that actually leads to increasing reinforcement of, of these issues, you get even more of it. And at the same time, if you have politicians that have not been able to establish trust, political trust, trust in their political actions, then you are also going to get more and more of that. But I do think this whole issue also of science literacy, civic literacy, do you trust what scientists tell you? Do you understand how science functions? Do you trust what politicians tell you? Do you even know how your own democracy functions? You know, there, there were movements here in Switzerland, for example, criticizing what the state, the government was doing. People forgot that actually the law on which they base their actions had been adopted by popular vote in Switzerland. They, the people themselves, had accepted this kind of political process. So unless you continuously are in communication with your citizens, your communities, and people, you will fail. And I think COVID has shown us that and we better catch up uh, as we are moving forward. Thank you very much. Our next question is from the audience. Uh, it is from Nita and she's interested in some specific techniques that are used to involve communities in health promoting hospitals. Do you have some examples from Europe and there may be others that can give as well uh, some examples of the kind of engagement specifically that you're talking about around empowerment and building community capacity for engagement? Well, I'm not personally that involved in the health promoting hospitals pro program anymore, but, uh, and it's a global one now, of course, which is also brings in, you know, different cultures of, of health and hospitals. But definitely, you know, the uh, health promoting hospitals concept was based on what we have called the settings approach. You know, first of all, the hospital is a major factor in any community. And therefore it has to reach out to the community and the community has to be part of that. And we've had some examples where, you know, the building of hospitals in itself within a community, suddenly this thing comes here, has to be a part of uh, the community debate. Will they be able to use the hospital garden? Will the hospital being there bring new shops? Will that mean that public transport gets better because a hospital is here. You know, there are those kinds of community issues, jobs, for example, at, at all levels. Then there are the hospital issues within the hospital. Is the hospital democratic? Do the nurses have any say here? And we've seen that in COVID where the nurses have had no say, where they have not been protected. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of transparency towards the patient. You know, what is the patient told? How can the patient communicate with, uh, the, um, uh, with the professionals? Are the, is the family involved? You know, there, there are so many elements. Many of these elements are design elements in the sense, you know, is the hospital welcoming? In one of the hospitals uh, close uh, to where I used to work, uh, they actually, you know, did, uh, they had put a kitchen in there so that uh, some uh, uh, of the patients could do baking uh, in the hospital. And the whole approach to having a, a different sense of smell in the hospital already meant a difference. So there is many, many components 
privacy is, is an important component. So if you go uh, to the health promoting hospitals uh, network, uh, you can find you know, examples in Japan and South Korea, in Australia, you can find examples around the world where people have tried to make hospitals places that are more transparent, uh, that care about well-being as well, and uh, that are good places for patients, but also for the people who work there. Because we've seen with COVID the situation for particularly nurses and carers who work in hospitals are in some cases absolutely atrocious, and we just cannot accept that. Thank you very much. This is a question from a Canadian who is a part of the Ottawa Charter Wave. Wow. We how, yeah, we have some people that are have been long-standing advocates and champions mm -hmm. who are looking onto this talk with great, great pride. Um, to be revisiting the Ottawa Charter at this time, we have seen how global support and efforts crossed across sectors have embraced upstream effects. More recently, however, efforts to address diseases have moved us away from this. And now COVID has certainly caused us to prioritize acute care responses. How do you feel we can be beginning to bend the curve back towards prevention? How can we increase this dialogue about a balanced set of priorities and investments that both respond to acute crises, but also invest in future and upstream health? Um, are, are strategies such as One Health built to address this balance? Or as we just heard from Martin McKee, do we look to approaches such as right to protect? How would you characterize strategies these days that balance the right combination of, of these types of focus? Well, I think to some extent, the more the merrier, as long as you know it, it goes forward in, in terms of integrated and collaborative approaches. I, I think actually, you know, with uh, on the one hand, yes. Uh, the countries have been very concerned about their emergency beds and all of this, but we have, you know, an amount of societal discussions about determinants of health that we have not had in a long time. You know, people analyzing who has actually died from COVID have told society, newspapers have been full of it. It's not just the old people, it's the poor people, it's racism, it's where you live, it's whether you can stay at home or whether you're the bus driver who has to go to work. So actually social determinants have moved to the fore in a new way. Also, you know, a number of the uh, pandemic preparedness initiatives I'm involved in, like the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, has said very clearly there can be no health security without social security. So, you know, countries that have been able to give furlough payments, for example, uh, have fared much better in terms of dealing uh, with the pandemic than uh, countries that uh, have let people fall into poverty, either for reasons that they don't have the financial resources, like in many of the poorer countries, or because they have a political system and an ideology that doesn't uh, um, let them do that, you know. So I, I think, uh, I personally feel we, these things have come to the fore and it is our responsibility also as public health professionals, as uh, health promotion professionals, to you know, really, really use this opportunity. Just a very small example, you know, in Germany for eons, we have been saying strengthen public health, strengthen public health, strengthen public health. No one was interested. COVID has come along and the government has spoken 4 billion euro, 4 billion euro to strengthen public health in Germany. Now it's our responsibility to say, hey, but you're not only going to strengthen infectious diseases, you are also going to do A, B, C, D, E. And that now means, you know, pushing up political pressure, making advocacy and making very, very concrete suggestions on how to do that. And we've started to involve major foundations to help us, parliamentarians, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I think we have an opportunity here in this crisis. Some people call it, you know, a cosmopolitan moment. And we need to use that. Crisis has always also led to reform and we need to make that uh, happen. Thank you so kindly for that, that answer. We have a question from the audience from Janet in Canada. Can you expand a little bit more on the concept of digital literacy? We talked a little bit about that and there will be more sessions at this conference looking to advance that dialogue about the right combination of novel technologies that can be incorporated in medical assessment also uh, to perhaps surpass some of our barriers around communication directly with community members. Um, and yet, some of our dialogue is also focusing on whether the technology is equipped and whether we have the right ethics behind uh, using this technology for population health. Can you comment on any specific direction that you would have for us at this time to incorporate technology, but in a way that aligns with the principles of the Ottawa Charter and more progressive uh, recent strategies? Yes, thank you. An incredibly important question because, you know, the digital transformation is going to touch on everything uh, in health promotion and has already done so. Maybe some of the audience have been able to read an editorial I wrote in Health Promotion International, which was called, you know, the dark side of digital health. And uh, it raises some of the issues that we definitely need to look at. And, you know, the ethics of health promotion, the principles of health promotion and uh, of uh, the digital transformation and, uh, and digital health. And at one stage I said, you know, I would wish that this uh, in incredibly interesting work that has been done on, on, in Canada with a Montreal de declaration around the digital transformation uh, be linked to our health promotion uh, thinking. Because on the other hand, at least in our part of the world, the push of the technology and neglecting that ne technology, you know, is driven by social, political and economic interests. So that, that's why we're saying, you know, the digital transformation is to some extent a determinant of health. Uh, it's very much linked to the commercial determinants of health. And uh, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, this interface of health and well-being also uh, is ensured uh, with the digital transformation. We're seeing an increase of certain mental health conditions around the digital transformation new forms of addiction. And on the other hand, we're seeing, you know, fantastic stuff on getting information on dealing with uh, mental health also uh, through anonymous digital uh, health services. So we need to be very, very aware and we need to be ve look very closely at uh, some of the algorithms that also drive this uh, because obviously algorithms build on what was done before and how people think. And, you know, we're seeing that through uh, an increasing data-driven type of health and health promotion, that uh, inequalities can be reinforced, that racism can be reinforced, and that the poorest who don't have digital health literacy and don't have health literacy, uh, and often don't have broadband connectivity are the ones that are left behind in a new uh, way. And there are dangers in what people have called the digital welfare state. And we need an incredible amount of awareness and we need to work for regulation here. Rudiger spoke about instruments. We need to develop those instruments that really protect people. If anywhere, taking up Martin McKee's point about you know, the responsibility to protect, here is a responsibility to protect and particularly children and young people who use digital tools. Thank you very much. We have a question from Grace in the audience. Um, given the inherent interdisciplinary and intersectional nature of health promotion, 
I am wondering if there are any specific broad networks or professional groups, non-health oriented, she's mentioned lawyers, journalists, et cetera, that we have neglected to leverage or collaborate with enough that may help progress global health in an innovative way that we haven't thought of before. Well, I think there are many out there and uh, it also, you know, depends on uh, uh, on the issues that one is aiming to tackle. Some of you know that I was very involved with South Australia uh, in uh, developing a health and all policy strategy. And uh, it was very, very intriguing, you know, reaching out, for example, uh, to the transport sector uh, or particularly important issue for South Australia, water. And suddenly, you know, health promoters were involved in, you know, how uh, water is stored, how uh, uh, it's, uh, it can be ensured, particularly with the climate uh, changing as it is. So some of it is very, very local and one must be very, very creative. I think there's probably no profession and no sector that doesn't somehow touch on health. And if I go back you know, to the um, uh, Ottawa Charter with you know, how people live, love, work and play, we've said, you know, we need to think new spaces also, how you know, people Google travel, a uh, shop. And, uh, and so I think uh, definitely in terms of regulation, we must reach out much more to the law profession. We must understand taxation much better. If we're involved in global health, we must uh, understand financial flows much better. Uh, we must understand how money is made in health and uh, how those money streams go. You will know that uh, one part of health promotion is trying to address uh, investors so that we don't only look at companies, you know, are they producing good or bad things, but we look at banks, we look at pension funds, and we say, where are you putting your money? And you shouldn't put your money here. You shouldn't invest in Coca-Cola and in uh, weapons anyhow, but in tobacco or whatever. So I think it's that kind of creativity. My own favorite at present is the investment community. I mean, we have a global crisis and God, you know, these guys are making money as if it was growing on trees. And uh, if there is no taxation, if there is no social responsibility with how they invest that money, then, you know, we're stuck. And I think, you know, in that way, I, I think health promotion can be much more proactive in really critical economic questions. And you know, Rudiger in the past had a project on banking and health and those kinds of things. That's what we have to do. What are the critical uh, cutting edge issues and how does money flow in our society and who actually gets it? And you know, we don't just want a couple of philanthropists being nice to poor people. We want reliable publicly financed systems that protect their population. And that's what health promotion is about. Yes, and if, if I just may just add, uh, Ilona, absolutely. Um, on the banking side, you just mentioned it, we, we've been working together on this, Ilona. Um, Many, many more investment bankers want to know where to best invest now, uh, especially now during COVID. We receive a lot of requests to say, okay, we disinvest from tobacco, that's clear, but where do we invest in? And I think um, that is something we need to be much better also from our side to then be able to say, these are the sorts of investment and we have very clear indicators tangible indicators, how you actually produce better health through healthy investments. And uh, that will be, I guess, the next step for us to, to work on. Uh, but you're absolutely right. This, this really moves big things because uh, in the last year alone, pension funds have disinvested from tobacco in the range of 10 trillion US dollars. And they want to know from us where to invest those 10 trillion in. So just to say, yeah, there's many networks we need to 
look at much, much more closely in the health promotion community. Thank you so much, Dr. Kreck and Professor Kickbush. We are thrilled with your ability to stay with us and to respond to these questions on your feet. Um, we've had hundreds here very, very rapidly listening and we'll be recording the session for future dissemination. But I wanna thank every member of the panel today as we close this plenary and move to our next session. Uh, Dr. Kick Bush, Mihaly Kokeni, Veronica Shiroya, Rudiker Krach, our translators. Thank you very, very much. And I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.